it gives me great pleasure to uh, have Associate Professor Andrew Kneebone here tonight. Uh, we work with Andrew on a number of fronts. He really doesn't need much of an introduction. And tonight he's going to, um, to talk about uh, radiation oncology. And also, uh, Andrew, you got some requests to answer a few questions. Yeah, which is good. So without further ado, Andrew, thank you for coming. So thanks for your warm welcome. And I do like an interactive session, so I know where I'm pitching the talk and if it's at the right sort of level. So feel, feel free to direct me into area, different avenues. And obviously, I have a strong interest in prostate cancer, but sometimes it can be quite fun where we go off in different directions. So more than happy to do that. Um, so this, this is actually, the basis of this talk was actually a, a talk I gave at COSA at the plenary session last year, and I've expanded it a little bit. So um, it yeah, is, might know what COSA so is. COSA is the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia. So it's, it's, it's really an attempt to try to get all the clinicians and allied health staff, so nurses, social workers, dieticians, medical oncologists, surgeons, all together in one forum to, to be a cancer sort of forum. So it's great in vision. Um, we, um, and so it's got a lot of merits, but I probably won't discuss the pros and cons of COSA at this sort of point, point in time, but if, but if you'd like, um, I'm more than happy to do so. Um, and the port, point of this sort of talk is we can, um, we can talk about radiotherapy and the changes that are happening, and we've got this real dilemma in, in all of oncology circles. Surgeons are getting that in about the role of technology. Surgeons talk about the robot versus laparoscopic versus open and all of these sort of dilemmas. We've got it hugely in radiation oncology about all the different types of treatment. We've got the gamma knife, we've got IMRT, you've got HDR, and it becomes like the arms race. And a lot of it can become marketing and um, really, to be honest, I think we're getting very good at getting rid of the cancer within the prostate area. And our challenges really are if cells have spread outside of the prostate. Um, and so we can get fixated about the differences and nuances of different treatment, but really the threat from prostate cancer is if it has spread outside of the prostate cancer. And that's, that's where we are developing some exciting developments. But I'll concentrate a bit on radiation oncology. And really, it's crumbs. It's an exciting time in our sort of specialty compared to when I sort of trained um, 15 years. It's even a bit longer. Um, before, when I, when I was a trainee, um, so this, this was um, how we, we, we did our radiation oncology sort of planning. So we, we did a plain x-ray on a patient. We got out our coloured pencils. Um, and you know, basically, you guessed where the prostate was. And you can see the outlines of the, that that box, so we could treat in radiation a box sort of shape. Everything within that sort of box got sort of blasted. And you can, you can sort of sense that, um, you know, there's an awful lot of collateral sort of damage. And we gave doses at the time of 66 gray, um, and the control rates weren't great, and the side effects were enormous. And our clinics in prostate cancer clinics were just, you know, managing side effects and complications, especially bowel damage, was a big part of what we did when we were registrars and trainees. Um, and, and so that's given radiotherapy a, a pretty bad name. You know, a lot of the older urologists, you know, who've seen a lot of that, um, you, know, you know, and we've got to change that sort of culture, you know, play down radiation oncology. Um, and and this, is, this is part of what's sort of happening. And what I talked about, the, the, the arms race um, that we're experiencing is the explosion in technology previously the old machines, you know, 50, 60 years were a radioactive material called cobalt, long concrete tunnel, and it pointed roughly in the direction that you wanted. And then we had li linear accelerators, and then we're starting to get all these exciting developments about IMRT, IGRT, VMAT, stereotactic, HDR, and it, and it starts the lingo and the terminology gets very, very hard and trying to compare one unit from the other. And hopefully I can give you a little bit of guidance what a few of all those mean um, and where we're sort of going with everything. So, so just to give you um, a little bit of background, where were we in the mid-90s? Um, so, you know, 15 to sort of 20 years ago. Um, and we were um, combined, as you'll probably gather, I'm a believer in data and collecting data. Um, we were responsible for the first published series in Australia, 500 patients between Liverpool and Westmead hospitals. I was based at Liverpool for about 11 years. I um, also did a fellowship at Westmead. 
Um, and so, and we were treated patients with a uniform technique, 66 gray, which was standard, minimal hormone use, um, and we just incorporated CT into our planning sort of process. And these were the sort of results that we're sort of um, looking at. And as you can see, for overall for 66 gray radiation, about half of patients were biochemically disease free at five years. We talk about biochemical disease free, meaning have basically um, a very low non-rising PSA. Um, and our attitude is if at five years your PSA is piddly spot, <laughs> then the likelihood that you've got a worrying cancer gets very, very small. Though late relapses can occur, and if, you, um, if you're very young, then, but still five years is a pretty important endpoint for all of us prostate cancer doctors. And as you can see, in the low risk group, 80% of people were cured. Um, in the medium risk group, 60%, and the high risk group, 40% um, of people were cured in the long term with that doses of radiation. Um, and as you probably, I don't know how familiar you are with what we call the risk groupings of prostate cancer. Um, that's pretty important. When we see a patient, first thing registrar will say, has it spread or is it in the prostate area? Um, so we call that localised versus metastasized. The second question we ask, if it's localised in one spot, then what is the risk? And there are three things that we look at, and that's the, um, what we can feel with the finger, the T stage. Um, the results of the PSA um, and the grade of the, um, the prostate um, cancer on the biopsy. So if you're on the finger, you can't feel much, that's T1, that's non-palpable. If it's a big, ugly cancer, it's T3 or T4. T2 is a lump you can feel, but it's not that big. Um, so again, T1, low risk, T3, T4, high risk. And the same goes with the PSA. PSA less than 10, low risk, more than 20, high risk. Um, but you've always got to be careful with PSA, and that's because not all cancers produce a lot of PSA, and PSA can be produced by benign tissue. So it's got its limitations. And probably the thing that's most important for us cancer doctors when we're assessing the risk is what we call a Gleason score, the grade under the biopsy. Um, low grade cancer is a Gleason six or less, um, and high grade cancer is a score of eight or and 10, and Gleason seven is in between. And a Gleason seven is a big different group of patients. Some people can just have a small amount of high grade cancer making seven, and some can have a lot, but not quite all. So if you want later on, if you want me to discuss how we classify the risk groupings, more than happy to go down that sort of pathway. But basically, if you just remember, 53% of all patients were cured with radiotherapy with the old, old techniques. Um, and then, um, between 99 and 2006, so we're now getting about 10 years ago, um, we treated 1,100 patients, which is you know, one of the largest series in Australia between Westmead and Liverpool again. Um, this time we'd cranked the dose up to 70 gray, and we, we're now giving what we call conformal techniques. And you, you can see conformal techniques mean we've got multiple beams. You can see those pictures of those six beams towards the sort of prostate. And the beams are sort of shaped roughly like the prostate. They're trying to conform to the prostate. Um, so instead of a big box like we were treating beforehand, you're treating you know, like a conical-like structure that's meant to be similar to the shape of the prostate. Um, and so, and even the second half of this study, we had even cranked up the dose to 74 gray. Um, and when you look at um, our five-year cure rates, just in the space by cranking up the dose, um, you know, overall 82% um, of patients were, um, were told that they had a normal low PSA at five years. And you can see 90, 80, um, 75 percent of people are cured um, in the low, medium and high risk category. So dramatically better sort of um, outcomes. Um, and one of the things, when we ever get our registrars starting the first day, we, one of the first things I was taught is that there's not a cancer you can't cure with radiotherapy, it's a matter of dose. <laughs> Crank up the dose and you can cure the cancers. But then there's the issue of collateral damage. <laughs> increase the dose and you've got to give dose to some of the surrounding structures and then um, you can, you know, you can cause significant damage. So we've got to always get that trade-off and we call that the therapeutic ratio and that's, that's part of what we, um, what we, what we do. So um, there's now been quite a few trials demonstrating that um, the proof in principle, giving higher doses improved the cure rates. And then the issue is how do we get the higher doses in sort of safely? Um, so our area of specialty, and I'll discuss a few of the other techniques as well, um, is at North Shore Hospital, where I've been at the last four years, is what we call intensity modulated radiotherapy. Um, and really 
crumbs. It's, it's exciting in the, our radiation community. If you told me 10 years ago that you could shape the high dose area of radiotherapy like a butterfly, you would have said you're nuts. You know, we can treat boxes and various different sizes, but um, we can now tailor the radiotherapy to sculpt it to be delivered the way we want to deliver, de deliver it. And that's largely, this is, you have multiple different beams, often nine, seven, nine angles coming in, and then the leaves inside the beams are moving all the time, modulating, adjusting the beam, so you can actually sh tailor and sculpt it. It's really incredibly exciting from our point of view that we can sort of drop those where you want it and avoid those where you don't, don't want it. Um, and you can see here, so part of a process when you're delivering radiation treatment, you draw on your rectum, you draw on your hips, you draw on your bladder, and, uh, and then we sort of instruct the computer, avoid those structures and plonk it in the muscle um, where, where the muscles can sort of take it. Um, and our attitude is, if you don't hit it, you don't hurt it. <laughs> um, and that's very much our principle of, of giving radiotherapy. Um, and nowadays, um, our standard dose for radiotherapy is, um, our main dose is 83 gray now. You know, if you told me 66 gray to 83 gray is just a unbelievable step from our, our culture when, when we were training. So, but the thing is, the big price that you have um, is when you're giving precise radiotherapy, if you can sort of be pinpoint accurate, um, you, gotta, you can't miss. <laughs> Um, you've got to make sure that you're on target every day. And so, and that's why it's the, the lingo is image-guided radiotherapy. Um, and, and so people talk about image-guided IMRT. But it just basically means, and it beholds all of us in the radiation community to make sure that we're, we're on target and we're hitting the right spot. Um, and I, I really think this has been a huge advance and a great majority of centres now across Australia have the process where we put three gold seeds into the prostate. And sometimes people get a bit confused when I hear about gold seeds because there's a brachytherapy where you're putting seeds in and there's this gold seeds in. These three gold seeds we put in are not radioactive, but um, they're small little pellets of gold which are totally inert and safe to put inside the body. Um, but we can take an X-ray, put three seeds in a prostate, take an X-ray each day during radiation and you can make sure that you're pinpoint accurate to the millimetre. So it's really exciting. We've got a a technique that we can give radiotherapy precisely and if we have the fiducial markers you can make sure you're on target every day. Um, and now the technology, it's, it's a bit like all this, the one reason why radiotherapy has advanced so much is all the gaming technology, <laughs> you know, all the Xbox games and all those sort of things, all the computer software and all of those sort of things. We've, we've probably benefited most from that, <laughs> that technology. Um, and so we now, with the same beams that are treating a patient, we can do a CT scan on the table immediately prior prior to, um, to treatment. So we can actually do a CT scan, you know, 30 seconds before the beams go on. Um, and it's something that I think we can be pr very proud of our therapists at North Shore. They're probably the only in the, in the world that I know of that have trained up our therapists that they can actually read a CT scan, know the position of the prostate and make sure that we move um, in patients that we don't do fiducial markers, the therapist will actually move the prostate on um, just prior to your treatment. So it's pretty exciting that Therapists can do that, um, and because traditionally that's been a doctor's domain. <laughs> you know, doctors wear the ones that can read the scan. No one else can do that. Um, but it wasn't conceivable for, for the doctors to go to the machines for every patient to make sure that the prostate was in the right position. So we've spent a lot of time trying to... So maybe over time we don't have to put people through the discomfort of gold seeds being put in the prostate. But at the moment, I think the gold seeds are just, you know, that much more accurate and more reliable and accurate to the millimetre. But we're pretty confident we can do a cone beam scan to, to within a couple of millimetres. So that's, yeah. How do, you it? How do you handle it when you have adjuvant radiation? Yeah, so that's, see the... Andrew, so, can you... So I'll, I'll repeat the question here. You're saying, but, but I've been sort of concentrating here talking about um, when the prostate's intact, and that's one of the reasons why prostate cancer has benefited so much from technology, because you can see the bugger. <laughs> yeah, you know exactly where it is, and you can put gold seeds into it, makes it a pe piece of cake, um, from, and that's why we can give such high doses. Now, in the post-prostatectomy, which is actually becoming a big part of our workload, and I've got a few slides on post-prostatectomy radiotherapy, um, you haven't got that sort of clear, <laughs> you know, clear sort of volume to define, and so, um, our doses with the post-prostatectomy are dramatically lower than what we can give in a definitive sort of setting. But in many ways, it still works well because the surgeons have removed the big lump and we're just dealing with small amounts of cancer cells. 
So if we give radiotherapy after the radiation, uh, after the operation, we only give 64 gray. If it's um, rising for a PSA, we give 70 gray. So our doses are low, lower, so we can afford to be more generous than what we are in the, what we call a definitive prostate um, setting. So they are completely different um, cases and scenarios, and, and I can show you a couple of pictures of the post-prostatectomy set, setting for you. But you're right, we, we don't generally put gold seeds in, in the post-prostatectomy bed. Um, you know, we don't, you know, we use cone beam CT differently to in, in that sort of scenario. Andrew, just before you go on, yep. um, I can remember years ago uh, that the radiation oncologist always used to say that the prostate moved around a lot while the guy was on the table. Is that still happening as much or because yeah, so you've got this image guided stuff yeah, that so it's we, easier? So that's a, it's, it's an excellent point that we now can make sure that we're millimetre accurate 20 seconds before the beams go on. But then, so that's what we call interfraction variation. So we've eliminated that from the, um, the recipe. Now the big issue is how much does it move during treatment? You know, can you, do you fart during treatment? Does your bladder fill up a little bit? Yeah. Um, and do you wriggle a little bit? So, so that's what we call intrafraction motion. Um, so when we, you can see on the picture there we've drawn on the prostate, but we do give ourselves a buffer of five millimeters to allow for movement during treatment for just that slight sort of subtle variation. Um, but we've actually, um, again, we've actually been doing a study. We've got some, we've got some smart people in our sort of unit that can actually monitor the gold seeds during treatment. And so we've just done a study of 10 patients and we've seen, can you take an x-ray at the same time you're treating them and see how much those gold seeds move? And if they move more than three millimeters, then you say, look, bonk, turn off the machine, there's too much movement. So that's our next frontier to try to overcome movement during treatment. Um, and that's where a lot of us are, are very, very interested. So um, excellent point. Um, so, and so when you're giving um, high doses um, IMRT, um, most sort of studies are suggesting 70, 80, 90% sort of cure rates for, for high, medium and low risk patients. And to be honest, I think any honest broker, they're gonna be close to the cure rates that you can get because that means we, any local treatment is not going to be effective if cancer cells are spread. <laughs> you know, and so an operation, if you've got a high risk cancer, you've probably got a one third chance that some cells have escaped out of the system and therefore um, your cure rates can only be at best 70% for a high risk prostate cancer. A low risk cancer, even though you think low risk, you know, sometimes there can be, the biopsies have been mis-sampled. <laughs> There, there can be one in 10 cases where you're not dealing with what you think you're dealing with and cancer cells are spread. So to be honest, cure rates are always going to be in that sort of order. And if you get higher cure rates than that and people saying, look, in my hands, 100% cure rates, you're gonna say, hang on, um, you know, what's, what's happening? Um, and so we've, um, again, we've tried to sort of um, publish our results, the first unit, giving high, high doses of radiotherapy from a machine. Um, so they've been published, but again, they're early days, so too early to really sort of be, be accurate. What is the you know, success rates of the IMRT program at North Shore Hospital? Um, but I think we've got enough data now to say what should be the side effect and the toxicity sort of profile. Um, and our poor patients who ever get treated at North Shore have to fill in this ridiculous 14 page epic questionnaire that records their like, quality of life um, and it's an American based system so the questions are phrased terribly but it's just it's the only way we can compare with overseas in terms of how we're going um, and so most people talk about the IPSS score it's a score out of 30 um, you can see on the top line that baseline we do it a baseline score of seven um, and the higher you are the worse your side effects and we can say that the average um, irritation urinary score IPSS score is the same at 15 months after treatment and when we look at urinary bowel, um, a lot of those traditional side effects, the average scores seem to be pretty much the same at baseline and at 15 months. So we're, we're fairly excited about a lot of those sort of results. Um, and so, um, so in terms of, um, I think the, um, the status quo has changed a bit with good quality radiotherapy, and we'll talk about other ways of giving good quality radiotherapy. Um, the, the terrible horror stories, <laughs> that people have sort of portrayed are, are changing. Um, and, and sometimes you've got to be careful with the way people portray statistics like here. 
we can say that the average score is the same, but I actually, when we look at the data, 10% of people get worse and 10% get better. And so that's why the average score is the same. And so I do counsel patients that, you know, if they're undertaking radiotherapy, 10% will probably have a worse urinary function than what they have at baseline. Um, and so we, we quote about a 5% rate of bowel toxicity requiring intervention. Um, and then there's the sexual issues, which is a, it's a real problem with all patients having prostate cancer treatment, which we can go through. Um, now, I was asked specifically to um, talk a little bit about MRIs, and I think MRIs are gonna become exciting. Um, and and I'll be can, I can even branch off a little bit of MRI and screening and, um, and where, where we're going to move. But in terms of the planning process, what I get paid my biggies for and what all our registrars um, agonise in training is that we learn where cancer is, what you need to structure and what sort of doses you can give it. So in this sort of example here, you can see that the pink is up drawn on the prostate and the glands above called the semibuscals. You draw the, the rectum in yellow, the, the bladder in blue, the small bowel. And also you can see there that this was a high risk prostate cancer patient that have also treated the, the pelvic lymph nodes. Um, and so you've got to know where the pelvic lymph nodes are located and where they're treated. Um, 10 years ago, I never, you know, five years ago, I never treated any pelvic lymph nodes because the risk of side effects and toxicity was, was too great. Um, we now, with techniques, have the ability to treat all the pelvic lymph nodes. Whether that makes a difference or not, I, I think is still a debatable question, but we can do, do so safely. Um, and we do have the ph philosophy of treating the pelvic lymph nodes, but not to say um, we don't know yet whether that's sort of beneficial. That's, that's, that's a, yep, go, go for Just it. Wait a sec. Another quick question. Yep. If you treat the pelvic lymph nodes, do you do so if after the operation uh, they are free of cancer or only if they show signs of cancer? Um, so, so again, I was talking about the definitive scenario. So this is where this man's got his prostate there. Okay. Um, and he's a high risk cancer, you know, high grade, high PSA. And I've said, look, I know that if the surgeons removed his pelvic lymph nodes, he, in this man's case, it probably had a 30% chance of having lymph nodes involved with cancer. So in view of that sort of risk, I've said, well, let's, um, let's treat those pelvic lymph nodes. Um, now, some people say if you've got pelvic lymph nodes, then you've almost undoubtedly got cancer in other parts of the body, and therefore your treatment should be whole body. Whether having radiation sterilizing the lymph nodes makes a difference to a person's survival, we don't know. Now, in the, now the surgeons have gone down the same pathway. 10 years ago, surgeons routinely never took out, they just took out the prostate. Um, and now when you go to our multidisciplinary meeting, the surgeon said, I took out 28 nodes, how many did you take out? So the surgeons are doing exactly the same thing, that they're starting more and more to remove the pelvic lymph nodes at, at operation. Um, and, and again, the data is really weak, whether that's sort of beneficial or not. Um, now, so, in a, so once the prostate's been removed, if the surgeon, if there are nodes involved, um, then we have the potential to treat those pelvic lymph nodes. Um, then again, there's the old chestnut. If the cancer is spread to the lymph nodes by the surgeon, you know, is our battle whole body treatment or do we still think there's potentially localised and therefore further local treatment can be beneficial? Very, very difficult, um, difficult arguments. And the, the older school will, you know, I will... I taught my registrars, I, I gave lectures 15 years ago that if the cancer had spread to the seminal vesicles, the glands above, that was paramount to having cancer spread in other parts of the body. But there's now good evidence that that's not the case and actually having further local treatment can improve your survival and chances of being alive. So I think the paradigm is shifting. Pelvic lymph nodes are a controversial, fascinating sort of area, um, but we're all becoming more aggressive. The surgeons are starting to take them out. We're starting to treat them. <laughs> We're starting to be a bit like breast cancer. Breast cancer can spread to the glands in the armpit and you can still be cured and have a long and healthy life if you manage that appropriately. So we're doing the same in both the definitive and the post prostatectomy scenario. Thank you. So, um, so we're, we're talking about MR, MRI. MRI has also gone up in leaps and bounds and, and again the MRI guys talk about um, one tesla or one and a half tesla or three tesla MRIs but now they're doing, they've got all these sort of different sequences um, that they're doing. There's what we call T1 sequences, T2 are the traditional, but there's now diffusion 
weighted imaging. Um, there's also, they can add contrast, gadolinium, um, they can do spectroscopy. So they can do fancy things in MRI scan, which is really very exciting. Um, so we routinely do an MRI scan prior to every patient that's being measured. And we do find MRI can be um, very useful in terms of delineating the true prostate, helping us define exactly where we need to treat, especially lower down where sometimes reading a scan can be hard. But what's really exciting from our point of view is um, diffusion weighted imaging. Um, so it, it, it measures sort of the amount of water and tissue, to be honest. Um, and if you've got a high grade cancer, it squeezes all the water out. And so a diffusion weighted image, you can see there's a diffusion weighted image in the top left hand corner. You can see how I've drawn it on in pink. Um, then that can be blended into our ma measuring scan. And so then I can, when you're putting in the dose, we can give instructions with the dose to plant all the dose where, where the sort of tumor nodule is. And the really exciting thing about the, the tumor nodule that's identified on diffusion weighting imaging, it's high grade cancer. It's a nasty cancer that squeezes all the water out. So we, we can now start identifying where the high grade cancer is and with our techniques, we can plonk even more dose into there. It's part of the more dose is better sort of theory. So, uh, and so we're, we're now realizing that MRI is going to become an incredibly powerful tool. And I have no doubt that, you know, when your sons come up for their, you know, say so dad had prostate cancer and, you know, um, I have no doubt that you do PSA, it'll be, if it's elevated, you have an MRI scan. Um, and if that shows um, no nodules, um, no high grade disease on a diffusion weighted imaging or appropriate, then you'll say, look, let's keep an eye on it and you've avoided all the nasty, um, you know, rectal biopsies and all those sort of things. I think the and a lot of the screening studies are starting to sort of improve our MRI technology and our reading to, to enable that to happen. So I think things are improving. Um, and we, we know now that small, if it's not big enough to be detected on MRI, the likelihood it's going to be a really nasty cancer gets small. Um, and low grade, small pockets of low grade cancer you know, are incredibly rare to be a threat to life. Yep, that's. In terms of using MRI for diagnostic reasons rather than yep. biopsies, where are we actually at now? Yeah, so and what's the time interval that yeah, you're talking about? That's what about? I said when your sons were talking, when your sons come up yeah. to their biopsies, I, I am confident that the MRIs are going to be the way, the way to go. Um, now, at, at this point in time, it's still, um, you look at the age and health of the patient, you look at the PSA, you look at the kinetics, how quickly it's rising, you look at the pre to total ratio, you look at the anxiety of the patient, and you look at the family history, you look at all those sort of factors, but a biopsy is the next step to exclude cancer. Yeah. Now, what often happens is, what our perennial dilemma is, you've seen some little pockets of low grade cancer, and men are in this huge dilemma, you know, do I treat, do I active surveillance? Um, do, I, um, do I get the prostate out? Do I have radiotherapy? Do I have seeds? You know, the, the Pandora's box, which is why the routine recommendations are not to screen because we just know the dilemmas it causes once you, once, once you screen. Now, I think and nowadays we're getting pretty close. I'm, I'm, I'm getting videotaped, but you know, <laughs> if, um, if, if it was me and I had a pocket and some low-grade cancer, I'd get an MRI scan. If I had a nodule of lump of cancer that could be seen, then I'd say, look, it's grown into a mass. Um, I'd probably ha have it treated. Um, if um, we know that there, you know, a third of men age, you know, in their seventies would have little pockets of low-grade cancer, but if it's grown into a lump, then you're saying, well, now that's starting to get more significant. Radical, there's combined meta-analysis of tens of thousands of radical prostatectomy specimens. If you've just got little pockets of Gleason 6 disease, they never cause problems. Um, so, so we're evolving, and I think MRI will be an important part of that. Um, it's still not rebated for prostate cancer, so you have to fork out the 300 bucks. Um, I still probably not enough to recommend it in the screening sort of process, um, but many, many of us um, are using it in the workup of patients. So, Andrew, also, um, if, if you're doing MRIs, does this mean that you can use focal therapy as a treatment option? Yeah, well, I mean, n now you start getting, you know, I've got that little pink hot blob there. Yeah. Yeah, you can start going, ah, <laughs> do I just sort of consider, um, you know, just, just treating that sort of area? But at this point in time, 
all of the surgeons, most radiation oncologists say, look, the prostate on the whole isn't that important a, an organ. Incredibly frequently, prostate cancer has little pockets elsewhere and it's multifocal. So our standard philosophy is just to treat the whole thing. Um, and that we reserve focal therapies for if you've recurred after, you know, high-dose radiation and, um, but it, it's, its role is very, very limited. Um, so, um, so at this point in time, focal therapies don't, aren't very popular <laughs> amongst the traditional establishment, such as HIFU and cryotherapy and um, all of those sort of treatment modalities. And, and one is because our inability to um, localise completely accurately, you know, um, the nasty disease. And also, I think, to be honest, the side effects of surgery, the side effects with good quality radiation are getting pretty low. You know, um, and um, so it's it's mainly if we could. So the the urinary and bowel problems, urinary problems from surgery used to be horrendous, um, but then that was matched by the horrendous bowel toxicity of radiation. I think both both groups have come to the party and significantly improved those sort of issues. But the main sort of issue is the the erectile the, the sexual dysfunction, and I'm confident that'll be the main area we have to work on for men having prostate cancer treatment in the, in the future, especially if they don't have hormonal therapy. So, so we're not in amazingly enthusiastic about focal therapies at this point in time. Um, now, so then I also was asked a question about, um, about the role of hydrogel. So as I, as I told you, my, one of my mantras is if you don't hit it, you don't hurt it. Um, and so there's an, a very attractive sort of philosophy of inserting a little bit of gel um, between the rectum and the prostate. Um, and, and so that you can displace, displace the prostate forward and we can get high doses of radiation. So you can see here, um, here's, um, um, I'm going to sort of wander a little bit just so I can use the finger because the point is not working. So this is the rectum, the bladder, and you can see here's the prostate. And you can see here this white stuff, they've inserted this water-based gel. Um, and so that pushes the sort of prostate. So, so instead of here, here's the prostate, here's the rectum, very often they're touching each other, to be honest. Um, now you've inserted this gel, so you can sort of blast that to smithereens and keep the rectum right out of the way. So it's got some, some attractiveness uh, as a potential sort of approach. And um, we were told, you know, the, the company came to us um, and said, look, you know, don't you care about your prostate cancer patients for just you know, um, you know, thousand or fifteen hundred dollars? You know, we will give you this hydrogel, which is just a water, um, a water gel and a piece of fancy needle. So they're charging you know, the bilios for. <laughs> that's, I shouldn't be recording this, should I, David? So, uh, it's under control. Yeah. Um, so um, and the, and and then it becomes the issue of technology again. It it makes sense. But there's no evidence that it's beneficial. Um, and do you just sort of say, look, you don't need a clinical trial to prove that a parachute's beneficial when you're jumping off a plane. Um, you know, give me the parachute. I don't want to be in a clinical trial where half get the parachute and half don't. Um, and, and, so, and so some things are just intuitive. Other things you say, look, um, you know, inserting gel can, you know, you're doing an invasive procedure, could bleed, maybe the gel gets absorbed over time, maybe there can be issues with it. So we've um, just had ethics approval two weeks ago, so we're going to do um, a study, um, and it's actually one of the easiest studies the first three patients I've mentioned to have all agreed to sort of take part. So, um, so we'll try to evaluate it in a, in a, in a clinical trial. What will happen when the, the trial ends um, is always sort of, a challenge. So we're, we're basically um, going to test the feasibility of inserting gel in and see if it works well. And I'll discuss where I think we're going in the future. Now, how long have I got, David? You've got another um, 15 minutes or so. Okay. So and, and then we can have some questions. Yep. So yep. I was just going to comment, you could say that if the logic gels with this... It, yeah, um, boom, boom. Boom, boom. Yeah, so this... Um, so... So in terms of then people ask, are there alternate ways of giving escalated sort of dose? Um, high dose rate brachytherapy um, is an excellent way to give very high doses of radiotherapy. You give five weeks of radiotherapy from a machine, similar to what we do. And then instead of 
giving the final three weeks from a machine, you give the radiation from within. Um, so, and so you can give high doses within the prostate and spare in the critical sort of surrounding structures. Um, and again, when you look at um, figures, you know, yeah, th they're, they're good. It's a good way of giving high doses of radiotherapy. Um, sorry for this videotape and you've just had dinner, but it, it's not everyone's sort of cup of tea in terms of, you know, you've got to have an, uh, have an operation, often being, um, you know, often be admitted overnight, lying still on your back with all these wires coming out. You know, not always a pleasant procedure. But I think, you know, when I look patients in the eye um, and I say, look, I, I firmly believe that both approaches should be equally effective at getting rid of all the cancer in the prostate. So someone says, look, my dad's having HCR brachy at the, um, the San or the Mater. Um, do I need to come to North Shore? I say, no, that's, that's good quality treatment. He gets it over quicker. Um, and, but, you know, it, it can be an unpleasant experience and there are alternatives to, to going down the, the high dose rate brachytherapy pathway. So good, good technique. Um, the other technique is low dose rate brachytherapy. Um, so when people talk about brachytherapy, you've got to make sure, are you talking about seed brachytherapy or are you talking about high dose rate? So seed brachytherapy is where you pay, place 70 or so radioactive pellets within the prostate. You've got to be can confident all the cancers located within the prostate, so it's what we call for low risk prostate cancer. Um, you need to, with both brachytherapy procedures, you've got to have good urinary function. If you've got bad urinary function at the baseline, it can be a disaster. So you've got to have good, good urinary function. It needs a high level of expertise. Um, it can be quite uncomfortable for a few months. But again, if you select your patients well, um, here's you know, you know, 1,300 patients um, so from British Columbia and sort of Canada, um, you know, pretty impressive sort of cure rates. Um, and again, the controversy, what happens in all the prostate cancer community, some surgeons, surgeons stand up and say, look at my results. And then the brachytherapy doctors say, look at my results. And the external beam patients say, look at my results. And you're not comparing apples and oranges. And one of, one of the world's most famous surgeons, Ian Thompson said, I'm not surprised the control rates are so good. The question is, was it the treatment or was it the selection of really good prognosis patients? So if you, if you select patients that don't need treating, you know, they could be managed with surveillance that they don't need anything, then selection, selection, selection. And that's why we've always argued surgeons often take the better patients, though they're starting to change that a bit now. Um, and so, and that's why we find it very hard to compare treatments. And that's why when someone comes in to see you, um, you've got to say, in all honesty, you don't know what is you know, the best treatment for any one particular patient. There, there, are, there are options, and there, each option has its advantages and disadvantages, and that needs to be worked through the patient. Um, but that's, that's what causes the dilemma, because in many circumstances, we've got large clinical trials that can give the answer. We don't have that in prostate cancer. There's no trial comparing surgery and radiation. And if there was, people would have said, well, there were radiation techniques from 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> they're outdated now. <laughs> and that's part of the problem with clinical trials that you, you'll always have that sort of challenge. Um, so um, this is incredibly important trial that, that I often um, put in. You know, we often, you know, in cl clinics, um, meetings, at, you know, 10 years ago, patients had what we call a you know, nasty cancer. Um, and, you know, high-risk cancer, high PSA, high grade. Um, a lot of people said, look, um, it's already spread, just give them hormones alone, which, you know, hormonal therapy will attack cancer cells wherever they are in the body. Um, but this was a large trial from a Scandinavian group um, for 800, 900 high-risk patients giving half hormones and half hormones and radiation. And after only a seven-year follow-up, which is very short from a prostate cancer point of view, there's already a 10% improvement in survival. Um, and with hormones alone, 75% had a rising PSA by five, six years, compared to only 20% in the radiotherapy and hormones group. So it's, to us, it's powerful evidence that you know, having local treatment um, is important for prostate cancer, even if it's, if it's high risk. Um, now we're getting into the new toy department. Um, so you've got these cyber ice, tomotherapy, you know, true bead, beam trilogy machines. Um, and as I said, we can now shape radiotherapy incredibly precisely. Um, and um, so one of, one of the areas we're now moving on to is what we call stereotactic radiotherapy. You know, we can shape 
as the radiotherapy, as you can see here, see how here's the spinal cord? You can never give high doses to a, a bone in the spine because the spinal cord can get damaged. If you damage your spinal cord, you can be paralyzed pretty nasty. But we can now treat the whole sort of you know, spine uh, and a tumor in the spine with very high doses of radiation treatment and spare the spinal cord. And we do special scans called cone beam CT scans. This is done during treatment to make sure you're pinpoint accurate. And if you have spe special bags to keep them still, dramatic sort of difference. And so we're finding um, that you know, we can give very high doses of radiation to you know, spots of cancer in bones um, and results in you know, incredibly high local control rates with virtually no side effects whatsoever, apart from possibly a, a risk of osteoporotic crush fractures as the bones get a little bit brittle over time over many years, but the cancer would have caused those problems anyway. So the toys, we're starting to expand our horizons, what we can do with radiotherapy. Um, and as I said, um, 80 to 90 percent local control rates that we, we just haven't been seeing with traditional radiotherapy techniques in the past. Um, and now what's, what's going to become exciting um, is, as you know, when I, if I counsel someone to have radiotherapy at North Shore Hospital, I'm, I'm going to say it's 40 treatments Monday to Friday over nine weeks. Um, that's what we call conventional sort of fractionation. Um, there's the real sort of thought that now if we can give it much more precisely and can give bigger blasts each go, I, I actually firmly believe that um, that nine week course will be a thing of the past. Um, we've just closed um, the profit trial which compared a four week course with a nine week course. So giving, um, so that's what we call 60 and 20 versus you know, 80 and 40. So um, bigger hits um, and we'll be awaiting the results of that probably about three years time. Um, and I'm fairly confident that'll show um, very, very, very similar cure rates. The question is whether it's at the expense of too much, too many side effects. That's, that's, that's gonna be the price. I think we can give the radiotherapy quicker it's just making sure that we don't cause too much damage. Um, but what can become very exciting is that maybe you can go from 20 treatments to five treatments. So you just go rock up, have your treatment five times, Monday to Friday, yeah. Um, one week of treatment lying on the machine um, and already there are sort of units starting to, starting to do that where you give very big blasts um, and you know, this is in, in the United States um, from Boston showing you know, 94% four-year disease-free survival, promising rates, very promising toxicity. And this is where something like the hydrogel could become f invaluable. If you can put the hydrogel in, get the rectum out just for five treatments, gold seeds, monitor the gold seeds during treatment, um, then you can give this what we call stereotactic prostate treatment within five, five treatments, blasted, um, exciting sort of results and outcomes. So that's that's where we think we're going to be moving, um, is to make the radiotherapy shorter, more precise, getting the critical structures out of the way and making sure that we can treat as tightly as possible. So, so I hope that you know, if I was giving this talk in um, you know, 15 years time, then we'll say, look, radiotherapy, it's only one week of treatment. <laughs> you know, lie on a table, Bob's your uncle, in and out, you know, back at work. Um, you can even work during treatment if you wanted to. <laughs> Um, so, so that's, that's where we, we hope we're, we're moving with radiation oncology technology. Um, now, I might just briefly sort of go, my, my pet interest, I guess, my sort of research and academic interest is in um, giving delivery of radiotherapy after an operation. Um, and, and so, and we can sort of depend in our question and answer if you want to dis discuss that at all, but probably about a third of prostate cancer patients having an operation have what we call high risk features um, of cancer spreading outside of the prostate involving the glands or positive margins. And we know in that group of patients, in about half of cases, the cancer will come back as evident by rising PSA. Now standard approach for many years, and which I advocated as well, was to watch these patients closely. If the PSA rises, then you can consider treatment on its merits. Um, but there are now three clinical trials, and I don't know how, how efficient you guys are at reading sort of what we call survival curves, um, but there are now three clinical trials um, looking at what would happen if you just did the operation on these patients and did nothing more ever after versus um, gave radiotherapy within four months. And all the trials showed incredibly similar sort of um, outcomes. So here is the European Bollard trial. Um, so they had 50% 
cure rates at five years. If you had radiotherapy, 72% chance of having an undetectable PSA at five years. So radiotherapy halved the risk of cancer coming back. German trial, 60% um, cure rate at five years, improved to 80%. Um, and the SWOG American trial, 44% to 71%. So all three trials showed a halving in the risk of cancer coming back by adding radiotherapy to mop up any cells. So pretty powerful sort of data. And in the American trial that actually had 10 years of follow-up, um, they actually had a 10% improvement in survival, 20-year um, improvement in um, being free of cancer in other parts of the body. And remember how I made the comment about um, you know, we used to have the adage if cancer had spread to the seminal vesicles, they're incurable, um, and you should have whole body treatments. This is that radiotherapy is only a local treatment. So, and if you, for the 140 patients who had positive nodes, radio, radiotherapy, a local treatment, improves survival from 50% to 70%. 70 so, pretty, you know, that, that means that there can be just cancer confined to the seminal vesicles and mopping up the cells in that sort of area can significantly improve the sort of cure rates. So um, we sometimes have to admit in days gone past we're wrong and so maybe a little bit of our philosophy, I also said that if cancer had spread to lymph nodes and it was a systemic disease, maybe it's not quite the case. Um, now the big concern about radiotherapy is the concerns about having toxicity. Um, patients have already had enough going through a major operation. Um, now we have the capacity to give IMRT, so we can give radiotherapy precisely. Um, and one of my pet, um, I suppose, what, what I talk a lot about is defining the area that needs treating, where does cancer come back, delivering radiotherapy safely in that sort of scenario. Um, and we have those curves on the right of what we call dose volume histograms, which we can measure the doses of radiation to critical sort of organs. And we've analyzed, um, this is results from first 100 or so patients, looking at the toxicity and side effects and again, the curves don't look as though they're going downwards, they're looking stable. So we think with good quality treatment, it can be well delivered. Um, and, and so now we've got the dilemma um, that for patients with what we call high-risk features, do we give adjuvant radiotherapy right away, or which is be associated with some increased toxicity? Um, however, um, how about giving it a first sign of relapse, and that's what we call early salvage. Um, this is my, I can't resist the plug. <laughs> Um, for the RAVES trial, which I'm the Australian PI for. Um, but basically, we want men with positive margins within four months of the operation or extra capsule extension, and they'll be entered into a clinical trial where half of them are given radiotherapy within four months, and half of what's closely, PSA ever rises to 0.2, then they have early salvage radiotherapy. Um, it's actually a surprisingly difficult trial to get patients to enter because patients want to have a choice, whereas to be even groups, um, you know, you have to have true equipoise that you're not one way or the other. Some patients say, I want to leave no stone unturned, um, give me the radiation doc. Other pa patients say, look, I've been through the wars, doc, let me recover my urinary control, let's watch it closely. People have their own sort of thoughts and losing control in the trial can be, can be tough. So we've got a few million dollars to conduct the trial. We've got about 200 out of 470 now, um, but it's something that I need to try to continue to raise the banner for. Um, so, so I hope in my little journey, sojourn, that I've so sort of convinced you that radiotherapy has undergone dramatic change. Um, and I think it really does have an important role in both the definitive and the post-prostatectomy settings. Um, and the rapid ex improvement in technology has um, I think made a big difference and a nice thing now is we're not hurting patients the way we used to, <laughs> which is really, really nice. Um, trying to evaluate the technology is, is a challenge. You know, does putting the hydrogel in make a difference? Does the seeds put in a difference? Does the IMRT, the IGRT, the steratactic or the gamma knife, it, it's a challenge and it's something that we need to hopefully have as honest brokers as possible um, and not people empire building as sometimes can be a challenge. Um, and I suppose for patients within four months of a radical prostatectomy have T3 disease, um, please, if you hear of any of those situations, encourage them to consider, at least speak to a radiation oncologist is the first start, um, that there are options available that they should be aware of the possibility of having radiotherapy after the operation. So I think, I think that's it. So thank you very much for that. Very well done, Andrew. Thanks.
Now, we'd be happy to answer a few questions. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, you dealt with, and I very well, everything that uh, covers the four-month period or prostatectomy being in there. But having had it removed, yep. and a year later you're still PSA undetectable, yep. what are the decisions then to be made um, in relation to whether you go ahead with radiation therapy or not? Yeah, I, I think all the trials have shown a benefit of, um, in terms of the evidence, it's within four months. Um, so within, if you're 12 months down a the track, then I think you've already adopted the surveillance sort of pathway. And so, and I, I think we just adopt the approach of watching it closely. Because there is a 50% chance in the majority of scenarios, if you're looking at the broad group as a whole, that the cancer will never come back and you can avoid the rigors of radiotherapy. So, um, so I, you offer patients adjuvant treatment within four months or five months, six months, um, but the rest, um, so say there's a group of you here who've had the prostate removed and you're going, oh shit, should I have had radiotherapy? I, I'd say if you're a year down the track, you know, let, let's just you know, keep an eye on it and we've got, because the, there's only two things that can produce PSA, prostate tissue or cancer tissue. <laughs> if you've removed the prostate, the PSA becomes an incredibly accurate guide. So I actually, my, my dear hope is that um, a policy of surveillance is just as good as adjuvant radiotherapy and we can avoid treating half the patients. That's what I'm hoping. Um, that's what everybody, that's what the surgeons hope. But I'm saying is that if you've got the trials showing that adjuvant radiotherapy is beneficial, <laughs> you know, let's prove that a policy of keeping a close eye on it is as safe. And um, so, and I suspect that because we've got such an accurate PSA, a blood test, that you know, keeping a close eye on and catching early will probably be just as effective. But that's, I shouldn't, you know, prejudge, preempt the results of the clinical trial, but that's my suspicion. Another question here. It comes into the category of new toys, yep. and it's a problem very much at the patient's end because if you go to, for example, the MARTA website, yep. you'll find a couple of pages about all of the advantages of rapid arc. Yep. which indicate that for the patient there's in fact a critical difference between hospitals in terms of what they claim that they can deliver. Yep. Is there any sensible way that patients, quite aside from others, are able to evaluate this material and see whether this is a significant enough difference yep. to mean that they should in fact choose a radiation right. oncologist who in fact is located at the site where the particular piece of equipment happens to be. Yeah, and and it, it gets tough, doesn't it? I mean, it, it just so happens that um, at North Shore, um, we treat both BMAT, Rapid Arc, and IMRT. Um, we actually sometimes do a plan of bo both, and we choose which plan we think is the best for the patient. Um, and um, and so, I actually think you know, that um, the private system doesn't necessarily guarantee you know the best quality sort of treatment um, and it gets a real and I think people can have a real conflict of interest if if surgeon X is saying look you know, have have it with the robot with myself you get 30 grand um, I sometimes you know the MARTA can you know, VMAT or the HDR good quality treatment um, we offer HDR and VMAT but uh, probably what annoys me is if patients feel obliged to go down that pathway fork out 20 grand out of their own money and not told they can have exactly the same, if not better, treatment from a you know, reputable doctor just down the road. They don't know about that option. Um, and that, that's what frustrates me a little bit. Um, I don't want to sort of go on my you know, hobby horse too much because we can't treat, we've only got three Linux <laughs> at, at North Shore. We, we can't treat every, everybody. But um, you know, I, I, think, I honestly feel there's no higher quality external beam radiotherapy in the country than, the, than what we're offering at this point in time. But um, not to say there aren't good quality treatments elsewhere. Um, so it, it becomes a challenge. Um, and I suppose what I would say is um, it's the same way that people shop with surgeons. Um, I think there is, can be vari variation in quality. Um, we always say with the surgeons, it's not the technique that they use, whether it's a robot, whether it's laparoscopic, it's, it's who does the operation. Um, so I think 
the same goes with radiation. Now there is a marked disparity in techniques and toxicity. Um, then I think it, it beholds people to, to get opinions about what can be offered elsewhere um, and to really be aware of the differences. And I think it's nice if units can give their own data. So we can show to our units, here's our quality of life data, here's our publication, these are our results. We can, we can give you our rates of our toxicity in our institution. Um, um, two related questions. Um, why not go to the United States and proton beam therapy? And yep. the second question, it would be lovely if this comparative data for hospitals, even just in Sydney, was actually available in a coordinated way. PCFA springs to mind or some other source that is, is going to enable people, rather than having to go to every hospital, only some of them actually specify what they have and what they use on yep. the publicly accessible information but some way of being able to go to a central site that would enable you to say this is what's available at each of them and these are the teams that are involved with dealing with it. Yeah, so I, I think the, and, and it's a tough, it's a political, social, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of sensitivities can be involved, but I, I think the PCAFA does have a list of all the sort of prostate cancer specialists across sort of Sydney. Um, and in many ways, I don't think it gets too hard because in each demographic a person has, there's, yeah, if you live out Westmead, then you can try you know, Westmead in the sand, you know, two good quality units, and you can talk to those doctors there. So, um, and, you know, and s some centres, the understanding the real nuances can be a real challenge, like, you know, like North Shore, we, we do give seeds, we do give HDR, we do give um, VMAT, we do give IMRT, but our experience in seed brachytherapy is significantly less <laughs> than, say, St George unit. Yeah. Um, who, you know, Joe's done more than those than I've had hot dinners. Um, so centres can say what they offer, <laughs> yeah. but their degree of expertise and experience can, can differ markedly. Um, it gets really, and if, if you just start saying, look, all, and we'll just say for arguments purposes, all Dr. Phil Stricker has the best radical prostatectomy results in Sydney, everyone should go to him, yeah. you know, you know, that, that will cause no, no end of, it'd be the dissolution of the PCFA <laughs> due to outcry and it's not necessarily, and, it, and it's not right yeah. as we know. No, we, we were asked um, only just recently about um, promoting a league table of uh, urologists. Could you imagine that? Yeah, I mean, and... Uh, uh, I and mean, there's no, there's no way, but uh, that point that you make, uh, Andrew, about uh, the technique, uh, I mean, we're, we're often asked um, this question and we keep saying that it's really the skill of the surgeon or the skill of the radiation oncologist with the appropriate equipment. It's the skill of the medical specialist that people need to concentrate on. Yeah. And of course, in the radio um, oncology area, it is also the equipment. But uh, I mean, a lot of emphasis has got to be on the skill of the medical professional. Yeah, uh, and, and, and you, you want the PCFA to be advocates for patients <laughs> mm. and you, you just, you, it's, it's a quagmire that they can't, can't go into. Um, so um, so it's um, word of mouth. I think getting second opinions, talking to people in your area. That's right. There, there's only, to be honest, 12 radonks in Sydney who really treat any significant amount of prostate cancer. We're a small group. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and actually, the high high volume surgeons in Sydney are probably probably an equally small sort of group. It's we're not that not that large. A few nudges and winks in the right direction, <laughs> and you, you get to know the key players. You do. Now, what about that proton question? Yeah, the proton. So, and protons is again a very nice nice way of giving high doses of radiation. Protons, um, are, um, you actually get the nucleus. <laughs> Um, of, a, of an atom, you fire it in and it's, it's a bit like um, one of those depth charges, it goes in and then it reaches a certain depth and then releases its radiation. So you get, get low doses of radiation, you know, lower doses of radiation on the outside, then bang, you hit the prostate. Now you've got to make sure with protons that you've got to be exactly on target um, so the image guidance becomes absolutely sort of critical. Um, and, and again, I would say good, good technique of giving high doses of radiation um, but 
you know, would you spend 30, 40 grand having protons in the United States over an extended length of time? Probably if you had to stay in the United States for the two months, that's the additional, probably an extra 20 grand. Um, and, you know, is it going to provide that extra degree of, um, you know, benefit? You know, again, we can't compare apples, apples and oranges. Um, so I, I think, again, that we're very good, either good quality operation with radiotherapy to mop up cells or good quality radiation, we're pretty good at getting rid of it in the prostate area. Then it becomes an issue of side effects and quality of life. Andrew, I can add to that proton. Um, I was quoted 85,000 US uh, yeah. for adjuvant proton treatment in the US, and that is just the cost of the treatment. Yeah. And that was a knockdown price, I was told. Yeah, and so, and just because you pay a lot for something doesn't mean it's, it's better. Pam, are you going to get a question over there? Oh, good on you, Bruce. <laughs> last few, oh, thank you for your talk. Last few screens showed some um, mainly American tests in the late 2000 and five, six, seven, eight. Do you have any sort of update on them in more recent times? In, in, in terms of um, the, was it the last few slides. Uh, the, those slides. Yep. Um, so the update on them. Um, the 20, yeah. the 10s, 11, 12s. Um, yeah, so generally speaking, the second update will come about five years after the original sort of publication. Um, the, the updated from the, the one, uh, one uh, so this one, this study here has had the 11 year follow up. <coughs> so that's largely, and that's had the survival benefit. This was originally at just five, six years follow up. It's been presented um, at the, um, at a major meeting, the updated sort of follow-up, and it does, hasn't had the same degree of survival difference that the American sort of study, and it's thought that they, they manage their recurrences better, but the, there wasn't the same degree of survival difference that the Americans saw, and the Germans, um, that's, that's far too early to get their second update at this point in time. So, um, so at the moment, you're right that you're saying, we can be sometimes too obsessed with using the PSA as an endpoint, yeah, really what's important is whether you're alive or dead at 10, 15, 20 years, rather than you know, what, what your blood test is doing. So v valid point from that point of view as well. There's one more. Andrew, Andrew thank you. Um, could you comment on any new developments that are taking place that are behind the scenes um, in relation to treatment of prostate cancer? Yes. Maybe slightly out of your area, but anything that's coming through. Uh, um, we're, it, it's something that... Um, and I've, I've given a talk about, we're in some really exciting sort of areas. Um, a, as you know, with prostate cancer, we have our local treatments. <laughs> and then um, at some stage, cancer can come back. And if it does come back despite local treatments, then we often say, look, we need whole body treatments. And hormonal therapy can often control it for many, many years. And we're getting nuances of different types of hormonal therapy and uh, having pulses of hormonal therapy. But we're very good at controlling cancer for a period of, you know, with hormones, five, 10 years often, but hormones aren't seen as a potential cure. They can hold it at bay. And then the cancer can get to the stage of becoming resistant to hormone. We call that hormone refractory. And that's when it becomes a threat to life. And it can spread the bones, cause pain, and is the thing that you know, all prostate cancer patients get terrified about. And, and previously, we've had one medication, taxotere chemotherapy, which has been the only treatment shown to um, improve survival. Um, and um, but you know, chemo has a pretty bad name, um, and some pati patients with chemo can make a big difference, and other patients it does bugger all. Now, the exciting things are happening um, just in the last 12 18 months, there have been five treatments that have been shown to improve survival um, for cancer that has become resistant to hormones, and that's improved survival based on large clinical trials where you have either a sugar tablet or the treatment itself. Um, there's a new wonder drug, abiraterone, which I think you've all heard about, um, that um, you know, has been presented at a major meeting last year to improve survival with cancer that's resistant to chemo. I, I don't know whether I should say this, but um, it's just the trial has recently been closed for before chemo, was closed last week, um, because one arm was doing significantly better than the other. Um, so this is in the pre-chemotherapy sort of scenario. So. Um, so we'll, I have absolutely no doubt that um, in the not too distant future, um, the government will fund the use of abiraterone um, for 
prostate cancer that has become resistant to hormones, both pre and post sort of chemotherapy. So that's a big advance. There's also another receptor um, blocker called MDV3100. Um, we've got a clinical trial going at the moment, um, and that's an exceedingly exciting sort of receptor blocker um, because the hormone, traditional hormones only block the receptors on the surface, and there's a lot of androgen production within the tumour that actually drives a lot of what's happening. And so we're now starting to understand these pathways. And so there's medication MB MDV3100, incredibly exciting and promising control rates for cancer that's become um, um, resistant again in the chemo scenario, but we, we know we bring it early in the mix. There's even a large randomized trial of a radioactive isotope called radium-223 that's been shown to improve survival. There's a vaccine, Provenge, that's been shown to improve survival, though no one really understands how that works. Um, and there's even a new chemo agent, carbazitaxel, that's been shown to improve survival. Um, and we're also, so just in the last period of time, treatments, the, the amount of options becoming available for whole body treatments are becoming um, very exciting. There's, there's even the ranked ligand in, in, inhibitors, the nosinab, um, which you know, is, is there to strengthen bones, but also looks like it might improve survival as well. So, um, and as we, what we're doing is we're understanding the genetics of prostate cancer more. One of the problems with can prostate cancer, it's not just one disease. It's not just, you've got your 15th chromosome damaged and because that's damaged, you get prostate cancer. It's, you know, it's uh, often a combination. Each people has a combination of six or eight genes damaged. And so we're starting to understand that if you've got these genes damaged, you know, it's never going to spread. Don't worry about it. You've got these genes damaged, you might respond better to these type of treatments. And so we're understanding the genetics of cancer and individualizing therapies um, for each individual patient. So the, the bottom line is dramatic <laughs> understanding and improvement in the technologies being coming available. Obviously, our golden rule of cancer, if it's in one spot, get rid of it in the spot and you can be cured and don't have to worry about it ever after. But if cancer is spread, um, traditionally we've had treatments that can control it for five, ten years, you know, on average, but, but now we're getting significantly better treatments. Thank you very much, Andrew, um, for coming up the highway. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Um, Pam and I have had the pleasure of hearing you on many occasions and, and now a hell of a lot more people have had that benefit. So I'd like you to help me uh, thank Andrew for his wonderful presentation. No, it's been a pleasure.